And we take a lot for granted in America, don't we? Take our freedoms for granted every single day. We do a lot of moaning and groaning and griping, but how blessed are we? We do the same thing as Christians, and yet how blessed are we? Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. If you don't have that highlighted in your Bible, it's Psalms 33, 12. Seven years ago, as part of our 30th anniversary, Nancy and I visited Washington, D.C. Hard to believe it's been that long. But uh, we stood on the steps of the Capitol building watching as the fireworks went off over the Washington Monument on July 4th. That was a blessing. It was uh, very moving, and both of us got a little bit of emotional. And as the smoke blew into our eyes, we had tears. I don't know if it was because of the emotions or because of the smoke, but it was, it was wonderful to be there on that day in our nation's capital and watch the fireworks going off and all that means. We also visited the Smithsonian uh, Museum where we saw the original American flag being repaired that flew over Fort McHenry. And many of you remember that, where in Scott, Francis Scott Key wrote the Star Spangled Banner in 1814, near the end of the War of 1812. The flag measured 42 feet by 30, 1,260 square feet. That's as big as your average American house. And it's no wonder that he could see that flag from 10 miles out in Boston Harbor as the British were bomb bombarding the fort. Now, the means by which a flag that size could fly on a pole as tall as it was, 189 feet in the air, is also on display at the fort in Baltimore's Inner Harbor. You see, within the fort there is a barracks, and you will find within that particular barracks two eight-foot oak beams in the shape of a cross that were buried in the ground attached to that pole that held that pole so that it could fly in the fiercest of storms. And you know there's a lot of nor'easters that come up there. And that cross <laughs> was, they provided the firm foundation for the symbol of our national freedom. Now how's that for symbolism? Like most of you, I'm very grateful to God to have been born and live among the 6% of the world's population that breathe the free air of the United States. So grateful. I mean, with all of its flaws, people from many other countries will still give almost anything to live in America, to pursue the American dream. Now, in spite of our tattered image as of late, believe it or not, the American dream lives on because of the biblical principles this nation was founded upon. And I've taken many of you through those principles uh, throughout the years. I want you to think about this. Refugees do not flee to Muslim nations. They do not make it a habit of fleeing to communist-run nations to seek the freedom to build their lives, do they? Nor do they risk their lives to cross dangerous shark-infested waters on leaky rafts to go to some place that's going to oppress them. Refugees will not spend their life savings to get here any way they possibly could, legally or illegally, if they thought they were coming to another land where they weren't going to be any better off than where they were. The principles this nation was founded upon and built upon were biblical principles, including the golden rule, which says we should treat our neighbors as we want to be treated. However, this still does not mean that we should throw open our borders to anyone who wishes to come in. This would not be wise, as there are many outsiders who wish to end the American dream as we know it. Compromised American borders will eventually turn America into just another third world nation. Our founding fathers, they were imperfect men, but there is overwhelming evidence to support the fact that the vast majority of them believed and trusted in a perfect God and in his son, Jesus Christ. Now, collectively, as a group and as individuals, they called upon God for divine guidance as they undertook the awesome task of forging a new nation. You talk about a once-in-a-lifetime experience. Getting to be in on the start of a new nation I mean, many people think it's a glorious thing to be uh, at the beginning of a, of a new family, a new business, a new church, something like that. But a new nation, they got to be a part of this. Religious liberty was foremost in the minds and hearts of most of the 13 colonies' earliest settlers. I've shared with you, abundant, undeniable evidence proves that the founding charters 
of most of our original towns, cities, colonies, proved again and again the primary motivation behind each of their settling was the spreading of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the new world. Said it again and again and again. I've read many of them to you. Our earliest settlers arrived in America from European nations where they were told when and how to worship, what to believe by the government, by their state-sponsored churches. In many of those nations, the common man was forbidden to own this or to read this. They were not allowed to read it. And so they were often led astray by the clergy, by the preachers, by the priests, as well as the governments that claimed to speak for God. Now when individuals dared to raise their voices, when someone would raise their voice and protest against the government and the church because of their growing obvious moral corruption, many of those citizens were tortured. They were imprisoned. They were killed. They were excommunicated. So why not risk everything to come to America? For freedom's sake. Uh, to worship God as they came to know Him in the Bible they were finally able to read for themselves. How many people in foreign countries, when they finally get one of these, are overjoyed to have an actual Bible? The founding fathers understood that human government was necessary in a fallen world. But they also wanted as little government as possible. We've heard that all the time, don't we? You know, oh, my goal if I'm elected is to, to shrink the government. <laughs> you know, because uh, you know, that's, that's what the founding fathers wanted. As little government as possible so it would not become an all-consuming, meddlesome uh, burden to the citizens as it had in England and the rest of Europe. Now, one of the greatest fears the founding fathers had was that the common American citizen would eventually become biblically illiterate as it happened in Europe. In fact, ignorance of the Bible and its truths was exactly what the leaders of Europe intended for their citizens. For the most part, a corrupt European church conspired with the corrupt politicians to keep their citizens ignorant and therefore under their will. Our founding fathers understood that to keep this from happening in America would require its citizens to become knowledgeable of the Bible. It was the primer in every classroom. The primary book, how many le learned to read, was from the Bible. It's hard to believe, but it's true. I know. Knowledge of the Word of God gives any people a strong moral compass by which they can gauge the direction of their government. Imagine that on the screen, okay? <laughs> I had Jamie put that so she could put it on the screen. Knowledge of this. Knowledge of this book gives any people a strong moral compass by which they can gauge the direction of their government. Now you might hear things coming once in a while, certain laws, certain considerations, you're going, I don't know if that's right or not. That, something about that sounds fishy. Or you might just go, that is so wrong! Or that's a good thing. Finally, somebody's standing up saying that's a good thing that they're thinking. It was so common sense, why did it take them so long? But how do you know that? Because of your knowledge of the Word of God. Jessica was asking me this morning about the nature of God, what does that mean? You hear me talk about it all the time. Whenever you're married, when you spend time with your spouse over the many years, you become familiar with their nature. You know what they like, what they dislike, what hacks them off, what makes them happy. You understand the nature. I said, so many people do not understand the nature of God because they don't bother to get into the book and spend time with him. If you study this book from cover to cover, you will understand the nature of God. And Jesus, even coming to earth, as a human being says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You can know God by knowing me, he said. God was so good. He revealed himself in nature. He gave us his written word. And then he put on skin. He wants us to know him. We can know the nature of God. And so we can, a, a new topic can come up that wasn't talked about somewhere in the Bible verbatim. I mentioned this morning to her, I said, like abortion. People say, well, I just don't know. I'm so confused. I mean, there's good and there's bad about this. I say, if you understand that God created man in his image and that life is sacred, you would have no trouble with it by knowing the nature of the author of this book. I said, any topic, any topic, whether you see it written down in here or not, you can know how God feels about it by knowing his nature. Citizens can easily measure the acts of their governing officials by understanding the nature of God. 
what is right and what is wrong. And that's what the founding fathers understood. That's what they wrote down. That's what they wanted. Now, though England was technically still ruling the 13 colonies, the Americans were multiplying. They were flourishing faster than Mother England found capable. Uh, comfortable. For the most part, the colonies were patterning their lives in existence following biblical principles, becoming more capitalistic. They were becoming very productive. God's hand was on them. Whatever they were doing was flourishing and working. A, a similar situation had already occurred in the Old Testament. You stop and think about it. Remember when Joseph was in Egypt? And remember that there was a famine, and Joseph's family, his father, Jacob, and, their, and, his, and his other 11 brothers, and all their families, a total of about 70 of them, came to live in Egypt, the breadbasket of the world, at that particular time. And they lived there for how long? 400 years. And during that 400 years, they multiplied from 70 souls to somewhere around 2 million. Blessed. <laughs> They took God literally, be fruitful and multiply. Oh my goodness, the Egyptians grew very concerned with the Israelites' growing population, with their success within their own borders, and they clamped down on them. They were no longer free, they made them slaves. We got to keep a thumb on this situation. Now we know how that turned out with the birth of the nation of Israel. Well, 3,200 years later, England began to fear their American colonists' restlessness to expand upon their freedoms that they had been allowed and decided to tighten their grip on the colonies, not only taxing their imports, their exports, but by threatening to make the corrupt Church of England the Church of England to America. He was going to send his preachers there. Because see, the English King George III correctly understood this. If he could control what Americans perceived to be the truth of the Word of God, he could control the Americans. He studied history. He knew what had worked in Europe for the church and for the government. He was going to try to make it work in America as well. Now, you're not going to read about that in most history books. They don't want you to read about that. But England's threat to impose the Church of England upon the colonies was one of the final catalysts that helped the Americans decide, okay, that's it. We're not putting up with this. And they, it pushed the Americans over to rebel and form their own nation. Not only were they being unfairly taxed without representation before the King of England, now he was threatening their, their liberty to worship God, to study his word. So this is why the writers of the Declaration of Independence chose their words very carefully and prayerfully as they stood to lose everything dear to them that they believed. We, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America, in general Congress, assembled, appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions do in the name and by the authority of the good people of these colonies solemnly publish and declare that these United States are and of right ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. And that as free and independent states, they have the full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and to do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. And that was more than just words. Several of these men lost their lives. They lost their fortunes. They lost their lives in the fight for independence. Here they were, the first Americans calling upon their God while England called upon her military and her navy. Now these are the words of our first president. Who was our first president? George Washington. You can ask almost any youngster. Hopefully they can answer. He said this, it is impossible to account for the creation of the universe without the agency of a supreme being. He, he went on, he says, it is impossible to govern the universe without the aid of a supreme being. It is impossible to reason without arriving at a supreme being. This is our first president. 
saying this. He understood God exists. He relied upon him. Now, if you take the time to think about it, there are a lot of similarities between King David of ancient Israel and George Washington. King David, under God's guidance and supernatural protection, led the army that established Israel as a sovereign nation and led them to the absolute zenith of their power underneath his son, King Solomon. David led first as a soldier and then as a statesman, their king. George Washington led first as a soldier and as a statesman, the president. Now, as a soldier leading his troops, get this, he had two horses shot out from under him, four bullets passed through his coat, and in one particular battle, every other officer under his command was shot down. Following that battle, Washington recognized, gee, God's hand may be in this. As he wrote to his brother, listen, but by the all-powerful dispensations of providence, I have been protected beyond all human probability or expectation, although death was leveling my companions on every side. He recognized it. It wasn't wasted on him. It doesn't take much imagination to see the war between the American colonies and the British Empire as similar to the contest between David and Goliath. England had everything going for it, including a vast reputation. When England saw something and they wanted it, they took it. It's, that's where the, the, the saying came, the sun never sets on the English Empire. It has now. But at that particular point in time, English Empire stretched around the world. The most mighty fleet that had ever been assembled. England had everything going for it, militarily speaking. Eyewitness accounts of George Washington's miraculous deliverance in battle after battle caused many to come to the conclusion that he was the beneficiary of the same supernatural protection as King David. Washington wrote in a letter to General Thomas Nelson, the hand of providence has been so conspicuous in all this that he must be worse than an infidel that lacks faith and more wicked that has not gratitude to acknowledge his obligations. But it will be time enough for me to turn preacher when my present appointment ceases. I like that. He couldn't help but speak about God's hand in his life and in his deliverance. Now, as a well-known and nationally recognized individual, it was speculated that George Washington was probably the only individual who could have provided the leadership necessary to be our nation's first president. Those of you familiar with some of the people who were in the first Congress, uh, especially John Adams, uh, Thomas Jefferson, and among others, um, Benjamin Franklin, recognized that there were a lot of type A personalities. Of course, what? They were leaders. They had been recognized as leaders from their states, and that's why they were sent to Congress. And he had to deal with all of these people. But by September of 1787, under Washington's humble but firm leadership, Congress had produced the Constitution of the United States of America. Shortly before his inauguration as president, listen to what the newspapers put out. On the morning of the day, on which our illustrious president will be invested in with his office, the bells will ring at nine o'clock when the people may go up and in a solemn manner commit the new government with its important train of consequences to the holy protection and blessings of the Most High. This is a newspaper. An early hour is prudently fixed for this per peculiar act of devotion and it is designed wholly for prayer. Second Chronicles 7.14, if you know it, say it with me. I was going to have it up here, but uh, many of you already have it memorized. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and heal their land. From America's earliest days, it was this verse, the verse we just quoted, accompanied by troubled periods in our history that would uh, motivate America's presidents to call on its citizens to pray. In 1775, it was beginning the process of forming a new nation. The Continental Congress called for a day of prayer. Many times during the Civil War 
Abraham Lincoln called for the nation to fast and pray. In 1952, President Harry Truman signed a bill establishing an annual National Day of Prayer. That continues to this day. God promised in his word, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. Now, has that first ceased to be true? No, not yet. It's still in effect. James 5, 16. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Can you see the consistency? Old Testament, New Testament, the same nature of God in the Old Testament as there is in the New. There are many people who say, oh, the God of the Old Testament's not the God of the New. He's the exact same God. The exact same nature in both. They both agree, Old and New Testament, encouraging us to pray, to confess, to admit our sin, and quit our sin. Then things start happening, like forgiveness, healing. Unless that happens, we are messed up. God did for America as he did for Israel as a testimony to the whole planet, to the whole world, that he would do the same for any nation who will honor him in this way. So he didn't do it just once. He did it twice. As I said, our founding fathers were imperfect men, but the majority of them, at least 52 out of the 56 original signers of the Declaration of Independence, professed to know Christ. It's possible that two others did. Possibly 54. They had a heart for God and his word. Now, these men carefully laid a biblical foundation for this nation to be built upon that God has honored and blessed like no other nation, and I include Israel in that. I like the star-spangled banner over Fort McHenry. Like it or not, agree with it or not, the cross is the foundation that has held this nation up to this point. Remove the cross, watch us fall. Will history repeat itself? As long as Israel obeyed God, he blessed them. No nation could stand against them because God fought for them. Proof, historical proof. But when they turned their back on God and relied on their army and their wealth instead of placing their faith in the Lord, the world watched as Israel collapsed. And not only collapsed, they were dispersed around the world. The cross should be the foundation of your life today. If it is not, are you ready to make it so? How much evidence do you need? How much more do you need? It's this simple. Call upon God to forgive you. If you want to be saved this morning, I encourage you to pray with me. If you would.